So, I'm David Mayer. Uh, I am a freelance journalist, mostly write for Fortune, also for Ars Technica and various others, and I used to write for GigaArm once upon a time before it fell over. Um, so, I've been covering decentralized stuff on and off, I would say, for a few years, and it's always struck me, it was very interesting from, from the journalistic perspective. It's something deeply technical and infrastructural, but it's also something very idealistic, and I think that, you know, that really comes through in the, the hacking society and economies uh, idea here. So, um, if you could all introduce yourselves uh, one by one, perhaps saying what your project does, just like in a minute or something, and then why you do it. And Isis, if we can start with you. Hey, um, I'm Isis Lovecraft from the Tor Project. I'm a core developer uh, for five years now. Um, a Tor, for those of you who don't know it, is an anonymity network. Um, and uh, my job within Tor is basically to work on the circuit level crypto and bridges, which that doesn't make sense at this point, but that's what I do. Um, <laughs> Tor uh, is really important to me because it provides a way for people all over the world to get the information that they want in a way that's safe for them and also to speak to other people in a way that uh, no matter who their adversary is, no matter who's threatening them, they're uh, able to communicate. Um, I'm a co-founder and COO of a company called Ethcore. We build um, decentralized technologies for the decentralized web. Um, so, yeah, I'm the COO. Why, why do I do that? Um, I think it's, there's a strong need for, for us to have technologies that allow us to gain more sovereignty about our identity and, and help us um, interact uh, with each other in a truly peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So, um, yeah, and it's exciting just to, to develop these technologies. Hey everybody, I'm Elizabeth. First, I just want to say I'm very excited to be on the majority female panel of the day. <laughs> uh, yeah, you guys are the minority right now. So, um, I've been involved in issues around the open internet and open source technology for quite a while now. Um, in fact, part of that is what got me interested in the whole Bitcoin blockchain decentralized protocol thing. Um, I saw this technology as a, a way to start over as a new chance for the decentralized internet, which is part of what brought us all here today. Um, I am the co-founder of a startup called Lightning, which is based on the technology uh, Lightning Network. Um, for those of you that don't know it, uh, Lightning is, enables instant trustless uh, financial transactions without counterparty risk. Um, that can be high volumes. You can send millions to hopefully one day billions per second. Um, I also am an advisor to a company called Kama AI that builds self-driving car technology. Um, some connections of blockchain there. Uh, I do two things. One is I'm the founder of a distributed, a decentralized and encrypted storage network named Tahoe. It's named after the lake. And um, that thing was first released nine years ago, and we've made 20 stable releases in the last nine years. So that distinguishes it from a lot of other decentralized encrypted storage systems. And the second thing is that uh, what I'm now focusing on is a cryptocurrency named Zcash which is uh, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, but it's in, it uses encryption for privacy, um, so that not all of your transactions are exposed to all uh, users of the blockchain. And why do I do it? Two formative events in my early life were when I was 15 and I first heard that the wall which ran over there was no longer containing people. And the other formative event was three years later when I discovered the internet. And that was a very exciting time. And it seemed like all of humanity had an opportunity to gain um, human values and human dignity in a way that they had mostly been denied until then. And ever since then, I felt more and more like it's an unfinished revolution. And uh, the things that I have been doing since and am doing now are because I want that revolution to continue. Okay, well, it's good to know I wasn't wrong about the idealism stuff. So, um, okay, so this is a journey. It's getting from there to somewhere in the future. And I think uh, 
Where I get a little bit stuck and where I feel perhaps a little bit cynical is I sit and I wonder, okay, where is there? Where are we trying to get? And a very interesting point was made earlier about um, this being, a, at the moment, an infrastructural play, and you can't really think about the applications until you've got the infrastructure, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you think that, well, firstly, I'd like to know, how far do you, do you think that we've actually come? And then do you, we'll get to the, the where we're going issue after that. Um, I think we're basically in 1993 right now, in terms of internet years. So it's early. So yeah, um, <laughs> it, so it, it will take a couple of years. Still. I mean, to and, and before we have the technologies that we actually are the maturity of the technology, so we can actually see people intact um, on that basis. Yes. Uh, I think we have the core building blocks to build what we need in the in the future, but we don't have the the things built yet that we need to move forward. And I mean, where are we going? I, I think there, there was a, a phase of the internet before about 1998 or so when it was um, decentralizing, right? And then uh, a phase in which there was a new layer of centralization built on top. I learned this from Brad Burnham at lunch. Uh, I guess I already knew it, but he drew my attention to it. Um, and I vaguely sense and hope that this new era of technology will lead to another decentralization. So, and I guess, I, I'm not sure if I'm, I, I, can't, I don't think I can give a good answer to where, to a good prediction. I can only tell you my hopes and visions, right? What, uh, what I hope is uh, for decentralization of political power per se, not so much decentralization of storage, computing, and networking, and things like that. Those are merely a means to that end. Right. And quickly, like, in the, at the time of the, you know, the early web, right, did anybody, who used browsers without graphics in them? Raise, show of hands, now I feel old right now, right? So it seemed like these things were really not usable either, and it was like, oh, clunky, and lots of people hadn't heard of it. So I do think we are headed to a world where I very much hope user experience and you know, kind of human-centered design becomes more significant and more important. Right now, it's okay that we're building a lot of the infrastructure. You need that first, but then you need to go and build technologies that, that humans or machines uh, can use, and that's where I see us heading in a few years. And people, I even like to complain right now, the user experience is not there, but that's where we need to head, and we are heading. Yeah, I think also in terms of where we're heading, um, there's a big, we've talked a bit about risk, and one big risk that I see is that people kind of um, um, always think that decentralized always means also free, and, and that's not, not the case. I mean, you can use these technologies in a very fascist way, implementing all sorts of schemes on top that you then enforce people to use. So um, that's one thing I think we, we all... Um, we all should care about. And there's a lot of confusion when you go to events, like people per se think blockchain is like a freedom technology, and it's, and it's not, so. Oh, one thing I'm interested with the, uh, the whole sort of theme of hacking society is, is, this, is it going to be a situation where people know that they're using decentralized technology and they're like, yay, I'm using decentralized technology? Or is it something where it's going to be like, at some point somebody can explain to them, oh, this happened and this is why uh, the service has arise, and 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 I'd, I'd like to know your thoughts on this because Tor is probably the it's the service out of out of the, the ones represented on this panel that is in most most in the public consciousness that people choose to kind of you know go I'm going to go and use Tor, and it, it's probably the one that's picked up the most regular users, although I'm not really sure how many it has. Um, we at this point have about two million users per day. We obviously don't have. We have a lot of statistics at metrics.torproject.org, but we uh, choose not to collect obvious n numbers <laughs> on <laughs> how many people we have. Uh, one of the things to note is that Tor is, is not actually a decentralized system. Uh, it's semi-centralized. Um, we have the directory authorities, which uh, provide the consensus, uh, the list of all the other relays to all of the clients in the network. And uh, the reason for that is security, because uh, if we actually decentralize the network, we would make ourselves vulnerable to partitioning attacks wherein a client only learns about you know, certain relays in the network, and then, then uh, they would, since they don't know about everything, they may not be able to build a safe path through the network. Um. 
I mean, uh, do you have any thoughts of, uh, about the... Uh, I have some, yeah. This is an issue I've thought quite a bit about. Um, so, you know, how many people know that they're using SMTP when they use Gmail, right? Like, we know, because we're a tech crowd, but, you know, do your cousins or your, do your family members know? Likely not. So I do think there's a world in which you can have a large user base using a decentralized technology. They don't necessarily need to know all the underlying details of the protocol. It needs to be convenient. It needs to be easy for them to use. There needs to be, you know, a user need that's met. Um, but even, so for example, one of the things we're, I'm really excited about with Lightning as a technology is we enable instant, you know, high volume transacting. The end user doesn't necessarily need to know that, say, Bitcoin is behind it, so the first implementation of Lightning will be on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and they can then transact instantly or do things like content micropayments, something we heard about earlier. Um, and then if they want to know, they can. And I think it's, it's good to educate. But it, if you need to know the underlying protocol details in order to use it, that's going to be an uphill battle that most users are not going to be able to do. Yeah, I, I agree to that. Uh, at the same time, people who do know about that stuff and care about it are an important early market. And that was also true uh, in the early internet and also um, with this new technology. Uh, and the other thought I had was that the the mass market who's using it not because they're enthusiastic about the technology, but for another reason, they need another reason, right? So what is that? I, I think it's um, freedom from the control of one party, like one company, or in the case of Tor, it's often your local government that's preventing you from loading the news that you want to see. I mean, do you think this is going to end up like different versions of the services we use now that have different properties? more freedom, et cetera, et cetera, or are there going to be new use cases that simply would not work with centralized systems? How so is think, this going to manifest? I think we're going to see both like initially just enhancements of, of services we already know, like a decentralized Uber or whatever, um, but also like one, one project I've been working on was um, to use blockchains for making supply chains more transparent, and in that case, actually tracking all the transactions, what's going on is more or less not possible with centralized technology. So these are the things that, that I'm excited about to, to see and, and, and experiment with, basically. Yeah, with Lightning, I mean, you can use Bitcoin or you will be able to use Lightning to pay for coffee, but that's a use that's already well met. You know, it's not very hard to pay for coffee. Um, if you want a world in which machines transact with other machines, say with a tenth of a penny per transaction, but at a million times per second, right now we don't have an infrastructure that can handle that, in part because of the trust uh, in the payment rails, such as Visa, MasterCard, and so on, there's an underwriting risk, and there's, say, a 30-some-odd cent, U.S. cent, uh, you know, minimum fee, uh, transaction fee. So... I'm very bullish on the new use cases and the technology that will enable those, uh, in part because, you know, if our current system doesn't allow for it, you, you can't do it yet. So. I'm really interested in um, Bitcoin's application to uh, places where it, uh, you can't transfer money to or from those places effectively. And again, the, the core thing is not being reliant on some third party, and that's especially valuable if the third parties in question are especially like ill-behaved. Um, such as the fact that PayPal just lost its license to operate in Turkey. So if you wanted to transfer money between in and out of Turkey, you can't use that one for now. Um, you can continue to use Bitcoin there. Um, and I've been paying attention to the numbers um, because it, that's a good way to falsify your assumption of uh, success, right? And uh, with Bitcoin, the numbers are continuing to go up, um, and they've never they've never hit that sort of exponential takeoff that start Silicon Valley startups look for. So, I guess that may make them be perceived as failing from that perspective. But they've always continued to climb like slowly, um, including in all kinds of uh, remote and sort of ill-governed places like Nigeria and Kenya and Argentina and Brazil. And, so I, I think that's important, and it's an example of a thing that can't be done otherwise, because uh, nobody's doing that because it's uh, easier to buy coffee there. They, I assume they're doing it because they distrust their government. So another really interesting use case is that of China. So right now there's a $50,000 per person per year restriction on exporting funds from China, and a lot of people within China want to export money, you know, get out of the country. So there's this practice called smurfing. 
people heard about it. There have been a few articles covering it lately where, I don't know where it got that name from, um, where people that want to get funds out will give f friends and family members physical cash, buy them a plane ticket, and fly them out of the country, and they try to get out of the country with the cash. So I'd always wondered, well, why haven't the Chinese you know, use Bitcoin for this use case. And just this past week, I think there was a substantial uptick of people within China trying to get funds out, particularly related to some currency depreciation. Um, and the exchanges went way up. So, you know, the government can't necessarily crack down on this kind of thing, as well as Turkey, where it would be a lot harder. The government can't just shut down Bitcoin like they can shut down PayPal. I, uh, I would particularly look forward to seeing the ways that, like, towards onion services can help provide ways for people to like do peer-to-peer -peer payments since in Onion can be uh, your basically your ID. And so like in the same way as like a Bitcoin address, you could give it to someone in like a QR code and have them scan it. And no matter what governments are doing, no matter what they're blocking, you would still be able with the with both Bitcoin and Tor combined, be able to pay another person anywhere in the world. I mean, again, returning to, uh, I'm just fascinated by the phrasing of the subject of, of, of this panel. I mean, returning to that, the, the whole kind of hacking metaphor, um, there is, I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of kind of daring do to it and all of that. Um, but at the same time, particularly when you're talking about financial stuff, um, regulators get interested after a while. I mean, the Japanese regulators have gotten interested in Bitcoin now. Um, because Mt. Gox happened there, and uh, yes, that was rather embarrassing for them, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at the same time, you kind of want to break through the bad restrictions in countries. Uh, where's, where's the balance in that with, with decentralized systems? Do you think it's, do you think it's going to kind of have, have two sides, the kind of trying to break through that kind of hacking thing, and then the kind of, or the kind of, um, you know, we're, we're sort of startup hacking, et cetera, and it's going to end up being you know, a little bit more kind of consensus with the regulators. Wait, what are the two sides? <laughs> <laughs> the two sides, trying to break through uh, a resistance system and trying to just build stuff, I suppose. Um, well, in, in all startup innovation, it's, as far as I notice, it's innovate first and um, regulate second. That's, I mean, naturally, the innovation um, well, I was about to say it fits within the current re regime at the time, but that's not always the case. Sometimes they actually broach gray areas. But in, in most cases, the, the, the startup innovation is sort of technically legal, but was sort of unanticipated at the time it's created. Um, and then the, Often it, there's no precedent at all. Like, you just don't know. Yeah, right. From a legal standpoint. Right. That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah. So I mean, the pattern seems to be, from my perspective, and this is stretching back for decades, not just blockchain, um, uh, that you can't decide how to regulate until you've gotten your hands around the newly created thing. Do you? Um, do you think that um, Bitcoin and the reaction that it got? out of uh, regulators and authorities. I mean, it got a lot of bad press, to be honest. Do you think that's uh, going to have a bad effect on future attempts at decentralized currencies and so on? Um, I, I don't necessarily think so. I mean, like, part of the reason, I mean, of course, part of the reason why we have this, um, um, I mean, um, maybe let's let, if I talk about the, the experience I got so far with working on in other use cases, I mean, they're kind of the, the interest with, um, of regulators and, and um, end users are, or seem to be more aligned also. And in most cases, I mean, regulation comes down to, to protecting the end users. And if, if there's no need for that, I, I, don't, I don't see why, um, why there should be so much like antagonistic um, behavior in the first place. So the regulatory error is one where I did quite a lot of work before this on SOPA, um, you know, and defeating a bill that would effectively censor the internet in the U.S. and then um, also relating to blockchain, Bitcoin, and digital currency. Um, so what we saw in the U.S. was that New York came out with this law, and it was the first really of its kind, and it wasn't very positive for this community. Um, and they put it into place, and eventually a lot of startups left New York. And interestingly, a lot of other states in the US didn't want to be like New York. 
So they haven't actually like issued their own, because in the US it's state-based for this kind of money transmission type thing. So we're seeing a lot of regulators step back, and even somebody from the, this <coughs> loud truck, uh, CFTC, Commodities Future Trading Commission, in the US, like uh, one of the commissioners wrote this article that we need to wait and see, like that is the right approach for this technology. Um, so luckily we're seeing more of that. Um, the UK as well has actually done a really good job of creating a more balanced framework that doesn't just go in and require licensing and all sorts of uh, innovation stifling things. Another, yeah, I mean, we see like we see this regulatory competition like globally. Yeah, like there's regulatory Singapore. Arbitrage. So Hong one Kong. of the things we also have seen is a lot of the regulation is on centralized entities that are trusted. And there is some merit to like a Mt. Cox scenario. They're holding your private keys. You know, they, who knows what happened internally, we're not even gonna get into that. And people lost money. One of the benefits we have with building this decentralized technology, you know, Lightning, we are, as a company, are building infrastructure that's not custodial, is that um, you don't have that single entity and therefore we shouldn't regulate, you know, a, a more peer-to-peer -peer network style architecture. I remember a certain amount of hand-wringing when the internet was new uh, about, would this violate certain kinds of laws or make it too easy to violate certain kinds of laws and how will we be able to regulate this crazy thing? Um, and you know, it worked out. Just wondering, um, do we have any questions from the audience at this point? I wonder if um, uh, such a decentralized payment system um, will get established where the government takes um, the taxes from to uh, pay teachers and students. So I'm making a decentralized payment system, and that's a pretty far future question to imagine that there would be a country in which uh, everyone used a decentralized payment system exclusively and then how would they raise taxes? I'm pretty sure they would work it out. Like, taxing is not always easy, but it's usually possible. Like, I, I don't really imagine a society and a technology in which it's impossible for the government to levy taxes. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, I know of it. Yeah, have you heard of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The ethical way. <laughs> I think if it's taxable, it should be more ethical, right? So, I mean, your system, is, is it kind of auditable uh, in, in, in sort of the way that regulations would want? Um, kind of. <laughs> They're laughing. They're laughing because they think it's totally not. Why don't you ask them? I mean, it's not, I mean is anonymity, like, auditable? I mean, to find so out. So, in, in, in Zcash... You want to audit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's opt-in auditability for in the case of zero cash. She, they well, can't I mean, hear her because she doesn't have a microphone. It's opt-in auditability in the case of zero cash, whereas um, Taller is not anonymous because it's disclosing uh, disclosing all of this data to whatever government is wanting to do the taxing. And so, so I have an like, extreme issue with them using the word anonymous there because it's just. Let's talk about Zcash. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, Zcash is. Um, Z Zcash is uh, a, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin in which transactions can be private and we have selective transparency because transparency is often what you want. Um, and so you can disclose the contents of certain transactions uh, to certain third parties, right? Uh, that is imminently compatible with the current means of financial regulation, at least in the US, which is the one I'm most familiar with in the UK, uh, because the, the interface between the regulator and law enforcement and the financial system in, in the US and UK systems is with those, um, those third parties that manage the banks and financial intermediaries that manage money on behalf of the customers, right? Uh, so if they were using Zcash, it would be probably better for the regulators than the current state of the art, because the regulators would get a live and canonical view of the actual state of the of the one true, the single source of truth, which is the blockchain. Um, whereas in the current system, what they get is a delayed and perhaps inaccurate report from their um, 
counterparts. Okay. So it's a mixed bag. It's not that the notion that like people wouldn't be able to collect taxes or nobody would be able to sort of maintain order is um, kind of a natural um, ex exaggeration of imagining if this technology were so powerful that it would um, go to the extreme. And technologies rarely really go all the way that far. Like I said, I remember the same things being said about the internet. I have a question for ISIS. Um, in the wake of the Snowden revelations, we saw a lot of uptake in, say, like creating and, and disseminating, um, say, encrypted chat applications. Has that also helped with like getting users for Tor? And have you seen more you know, users and use cases emerge? Um, yeah, we have seen a lot of new systems for um, communicating being built on top of Tor uh, after Snowden. Like, for example, we. Uh, um, a volunteer came forward and made a program called Ricochet, which uses uh, Tor Onion services so that um, there's no server, actually. It's sort of like Jabber, but there's no actual server sitting in between you and who you're talking to, which is pretty cool, and it has like a whole bunch of users, and yeah. Uh, I actually don't know stats on how many users it has. I don't know if they even... Collect them? I don't... <laughs> yeah, I don't think they collect any data on that. Any other questions? Thanks. Uh, so we've talked a lot about cryptocurrencies, but what about uh, other decentralized systems and smart contracts and such? Uh, how can those be used to hack society? And how can we avoid throwing good law away with bad when we try and root around it that way? Thanks. Good question. So Lightning is actually a smart contracting system built on top of Bitcoin in and of itself. People like to say, like, Bitcoin can't do smart contracts. Actually, it can. Um, check lock time verify. One of the changes that was needed for Lightning was very useful in that regard. Um, one of our plans is to build means where you can, so Lightning is smart contracting on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, then you could build smart contracts on top of Lightning. Um, by the way, I, I went to law school, so I sometimes hang out with people in the legal world. They hate the word smart contracts because then they're like, okay, are we all dumb? Like, <laughs> people in the legal, anyway, as an aside. Uh, but, so you can have automated programmatic transactions that execute given uh, certain, uh, I guess, use cases or meeting certain conditions that can then be built on top of that. I know this is probably a question for you as well, just since you guys are very into smart contracts. I guess, I mean, one of the interesting things um, that, that, that we hopefully see is like when people experiment with these things, um, which aspects of the law are actually like useful in the way that, that you state that? Um, so, by what I mean, I mean, we, we're going to see an evolution of like how people interact based on these systems and, and whether it, it is actually a good thing to kind of prescribe how common law should work centrally or whether it's better to actually see what kind of things can work and, and this is like a system that we can really quickly innov innovate with. So, so that, that's going to be interesting and, and, and then comparing the systems that, that, that emerge from that. So I've got a question. Being a journalist, you know, I, I have a kind of high-minded view of my profession. I think that we're sort of, you know, trying to save, save democracy and all of that. I want to know, can micropayments save German journalism? Can it actually happen? I think a lot of it will depend upon user experience and incentives. Mm, good answer. <laughs> so this is a bit tough, and it's really a question that all of us have to answer, but we'd love to hear your answers particularly. Uh, as technologists, we often get to decide the future because code is soft. And once you have encrypted communications between people, then it's very difficult to uh, prevent some software from like just running uh, in the scene, you know, kind of even without being able to detect it. Uh, so, what kind of frameworks for decision making should we technologists adopt uh, to be? better prepared for the, the offshoots of what we may be developing. Meaning that we might see down a set of paths of the tech that we're building and the effects we want to create. But the technology that we build and technology that others build may combine in ways that we hadn't foreseen. And this may cause really bad second and third order effects and where regulate, regulators might step in and ban a whole bunch of stuff. Or may just be completely unable to do anything. Um, Things like DAOs, things like uh, automated contracts, especially when we get into <coughs> zero knowledge. A lot of this stuff is going to get really tricky and potentially dangerous. Uh, so we'd love to hear thoughts from all of you about this, like, 
wild frontier because we're, we're in a frontier now and we're setting the stage for way more crazy stuff coming down the road. Uh, and not really crazy, but just stuff that we, we are not anticipating today. Yeah, I'm not sure whether we can come up with a, with like the framework that can save us from from these things happening. But what, one of the things that I already mentioned earlier is like education and like being very clear about like, what the stuff is that we're building and trying to explain that. Like, there's a lot of confusion about what what's decentralized, what's distributed, what does it mean? Does it always mean freedom and and all this stuff? And I think we all um, are, are responsible to to make um, to make much more clear what what we're building and not just do like the next big press release that that kind of gains gathers interest and, and excites people, but actually be clear what, what this stuff can do and cannot? Yeah, I think it, it's really exciting to hear a lot of the theoretical use cases and all the things that could be possible in the future, but I also believe in creating real use cases you know, for today. Um, that's why I was so excited about what happened potentially with China uh, last week. So like people like to say necessity is the mother of invention. I also think necessity is the mother of adoption uh, for you know, potential technologies that could solve uh, a real use case. I really like those two answers, education and learning from real world, from the real world, from what really happens. And I'd like to add a third. That's a really good question that Juan asked. Um, the third is, uh, I, I do think, I do try to think carefully about such things as higher order long-term effects and consequences, uh, but at the same time, I try to have uh, intellectual humility that I'm not going to be able to predict what's going to happen in 10 years um, with very much certainty. And also, um, uh, there's a kind of values humility that goes with that, which is that uh, users who are using something that I invented 10 years from now, uh, they know better than me what's going on in their lives, and they may have different values than mine and do things that I wouldn't do or would object to. Um, but I have a kind of faith that uh, those people are going to do good. If anything, just being in this space right now is so exciting because every day you wake up and you're like, what the hell just happened? I Something know. new and crazy happened. And, I yeah. know, especially in the Ethereum community. Every time I talk to <laughs> people from the... <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, uh, Lightning Network is awesome. I like Lightning Network. Bitcoin loves drama, though. That's my point. Uh, Bitcoin, <laughs> I, I love Bitcoin because it's uh, got this um, stability and predictability and it's long, long-standing... Um, you mean like another a Satoshi a day kind of thing, you know? But whenever I talk to people from Ethereum, every time they blow my mind by saying, oh yeah, I just invented this science that could like change the future of the moon or something. <laughs> and Tor is awesome too. Thanks. We love Tor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, okay. everyone. Thank you.